7, a modern classic which elevated David Fincher to the A-list of Hollywood and became iconic for its breathtaking cinematography and editing, most of all famous for its shocking ending and grisly subject matter, yet it stood the test of time to become a standard for repeat viewings. Did you know that Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman would never have been involved if the ending was changed, or that David Fincher was initially given the ROM version of the screenplay, or that there's a sequel that was made in a roundabout way, also. Who is this guy lying on the floor? Watch to the end to find out what the answer is. Join us as we take a deep dive into one of the most acclaimed murder thrillers of the 20th century, a dark ride into the abyss of mankind's psyche and our place in this world. Welcome to the horrifying yet beautiful world of Seven. Screenwriter Andrew Kevin Walker originally from suburban Pennsylvania moved to Astoria, Queens in the mid-1980s and got a job at Tower Records. In those days, it wasn't the nice clean corporate mecca we all know today. It was like the streets you see in movies like Taxi Driver, a movie which Walker was a huge fan of. Walker told himself I'm going to write my way out of Tower Records so this will be my last week. That last week lasted three years, going to and from work every day and seeing the social decline due to the crack epidemic that hit New York so hard in those days, it put him in that vicious cycle of depression. As a side gig to the record store he also worked part time for a local film company called Bryson Entertainment, a company that specialized in exploitation films, films like Brain Scan and Abusement Park. His daily commute provided inspiration as it occurred to him that he was witnessing a sin on every corner. He then devised a story about a serial killer that uses the seven deadly sins as a reason for his killings. Originally, he wrote the script in mind for Bryson Entertainment, but then decided to shop the script to bigger players once he realized the script was becoming something else than an exploitive B-movie. He has said it became a love letter to New York and it helped him work out the culture shock of moving from the suburbs into such a dense urban setting in the middle of a social crisis. And a couple of examples of Walker's motivations in the writing. The scene where Tracy wakes up and looks around the apartment is a moment that John Doe is perhaps watching her through the window and planning his final coup de grace. Another interesting aspect to the dinner scene, it's often pointed out that why is it that Somerset doesn't realize they live next to a subway once dinner is over? Wouldn't a train go by at some point earlier? The explanation is that from Andrew Kevin Walker's time in New York, often the subway would be delayed by police incidents, most often someone jumping in front of a train. So the moment in 7 when the train finally shakes the apartment, it's because a suicide jumper delayed the train until after dinner. That's a large part of the mindset that went into the creation of Seven. When he submitted his script to screenwriter David Cope, Cope was impressed and told him that he would show it around because he liked it. Cope also recommended for Walker to get professional help. When Walker asked if he meant getting an agent, Cope replied, no, the psychiatrist. The script got to be known as the head in the box script as time went on and it gained traction in Hollywood. But Walker was advised to make some revisions to change the bleak ending. This was under the assumption it would be easier to market to studios. It was originally optioned by Penta Pictures for director Jeremiah Chechik, known for National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Like your typical cop thriller, at the 11th draft stage it featured an ending where Somerset and Mills rescue Mills' wife Tracy from the killer. The script eventually landed on David Fincher's desk. Only David Fincher didn't get draft number 11. He inadvertently got the first draft, the head in the box version, and he agreed right away to do it. He told his agent that he loved the dark ending, but then the agent became confused and realized that Fincher was accidentally sent the wrong version, and the new version had a different, happier ending. Fincher put his foot down and said it was the head in the box or nothing. 
When New Line Pictures was on board, producer Arnold Kolpelson was against the bleak ending and wanted to do the newer, happier ending. The ending went through a few changes, and at one point it had Somerset shooting John Doe. But that would have negated the idea that lust as a sin was a contributing factor to John Doe's death. Early on, throughout the film we see Mills overreacting to minor situations with a bad temper. The moment John Doe is posing as a photographer, he sees how Mills reacts with anger and that's the moment he knows what Mills' character is. Originally it was going to be a Denzel Washington project in the role as Mills, but due to the overall dark tone of the story and the bleak ending he backed out. Years later Washington regretted his decision after seeing how great the movie was. After watching Legends of the Fall, Fincher then recruited Brad Pitt to jump on board with the first draft, and Brad Pitt agreed only under the condition that the first draft is the one to be filmed with the head in the box ending. When Fincher was told that the script was sent to Morgan Freeman, he never dreamed that Freeman would say yes due to his wholesome image and voice. To his surprise, Freeman said yes. When Fincher told Morgan Freeman that the script was at risk of having a changed ending, Freeman said to lend his support for the original draft. Eventually, Arnold Copelson said yes and the head in the box ending was a go. Originally, David Fincher wanted to cut to black and then to the end credits the moment after Mills shoots John Doe. Copelson asked for a compromise to at least have a more hopeful moment before the credits. We now hear Somerset quoting a passage from Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway once wrote, The world is a fine place and worth fighting for. I agree with the second part. If Fincher had never gotten the original draft by accident, we probably would have never seen his vision of this dark masterpiece. At the time, David Fincher was the world's hottest director coming off years of visually stunning commercials and music videos, most notably Madonna and Janet Jackson. He had directed Alien 3 for 20th Century Fox and had such a terrible time fighting for his vision he swore he would never direct a big studio project again. Alien 3 was a visually stunning movie, but the script had gone through so many changes that the final product was disappointing for a lot of Alien fans, and Fincher himself wanted his name to taken off the movie at one point. That changed with the seven script. Andrew Kevin Walker's first draft lifted Fincher out of his hesitation. Now, with a newfound freedom to direct the script the way he wanted, he recruited a team of visual masters to help bring his vision to the screen. Most of the artists and craftsmen came from the commercial world who previously worked with Fincher. Most notably was Darius Kanji a French cinematographer famous for his work on films like Delicatessen and City of Lost Children. Fincher also recruited Kyle Cooper, who designed the groundbreaking title sequence. The original opening scene was Somerset inspecting a house in the country in an idyllic farm where he speaks about his plans to retire. Then the opening title sequence was going to be him driving back to the city and the closer he got, the visuals would devolve into a darker sinister tone from the opening scene. Kyle Cooper then pitched a new idea to Fincher to show the psyche of the killer. He stated the common horror thriller trope would be to introduce the monster or killer in the third act. Well, why not show what's inside the killer's mind early on? Inspired by the photography of Joel Peter Witkins, an artist who utilized real corpses in his work, and the opening title sequence from To Kill a Mockingbird, Cooper did some close-ups of the props for John Doe's notebooks and it was edited together to the pounding rhythm of a 9 Inch Nails remix. The actual titles themselves came from 10,000 feet of film from shooting sessions of any type of visual experiment one could think of, things such as hitting the camera, opening the gate to get exposure flares, moving the title as the camera was running, placing random pieces of glass over the lens. The editor then went through all that footage to pick the most interesting visual moments and spliced it all together. The opening credits are often the most talked about aspect of the movie and inspired hundreds of copycats which still appear to this day. 
The notebooks were put together by a team of artists who spent months writing in text by hand. From front to back, they were given documents and files as inspiration, even including an actual suicide note from a prisoner which had ink that was stained by his actual tears. When people on set realized there were real elements included in the notebooks, they became apprehensive while turning the pages. This was the desired effect on camera, as cast members were not sure exactly what they were handling. What you see on screen are genuine reactions to what's in the notebooks. The cinematography was also a new benchmark in the 1990s. Previously, many films relied heavily on HMI lights and newer low-grain film stocks in a quest to get the clearest, sharpest image possible from a high-exposure film. Various Kanji and the production designer were told by Fincher that he wanted to emulate two films in particular, Clute and Malice, both shot by legendary cinematographer Gordon Willis, aka The Prince of Darkness, also the photography of Robert Frank, particularly a book called The Americans which Fincher and Kanji kept close by for references. Kanji lit the film extensively with newly released and rarely utilized Kino Flow fluorescent lights which were used to emulate that top light look of Gordon Willis. It also gave a more motivated, realistic feel to the lighting placements than the larger on-set HMI lights that have a harsher, blue look. The most interesting aspect of the look of Seven was the bleach bypass process, which was projected in a select number of theaters around the world in major cities. This involves retaining a layer of silver on the film print to give the darker areas of the image a deeper, almost tactile look when projected on a celluloid projector. It's a process that cannot be fully recreated digitally, and before the film was released, producers showcased a highlight reel to exhibitors at a convention, and when they saw the results, it threw threw them into a tizzy to get the rights to show the movie. The legacy, despite the hesitation early on by various actors and producers to create such a dark movie, it went on to be a huge success and even made it to Roger Ebert's 50 all-time best movies list, as well as American cinematographer's 20th century list. It created a milestone for visuals, editing and title design and was a box office smash, making it, you guessed it, 7th highest grossing movie of 1995. A sequel was planned, called 8, featuring Somerset acquiring psychic skill to connect to serial killers. The concept didn't sit well with David Fincher or either of the actors so it got redeveloped as the movie Solace, starring Anthony Hopkins. Seven sits there alone as one movie, a thrilling, terrifying meditation on the human condition, disguised as a serial killer police procedural, a flashy, horrific spectacle of flesh and sinew without showing any actual violence, yet in the mind's eye it sits as one of the most violent movies ever made. It's a classic film that has stood the test of time that still looks like it was made yesterday. David Fincher set out to emulate the classic movies he grew up on, those movies like Clute and Chinatown which don't have a happy ending. He succeeded and shook off the experience of Alien 3 to create one great film after another going on two decades, all thanks to a screenplay featuring a head in the box that accidentally got sent by an agent. So who was this guy? Well, that's Andrew Kevin Walker doing quite an interesting cameo as the first corpse seen in the movie. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe and check out the links below. If you're looking to build your physical media collection, check out TerminalCityCollectibles.com, which is our physical media store. We do videos like this as well as shorts, a podcast, another thing. So keep the discussion going below. Until next time, dweeb out.